Yep, microphone is on. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Bast. I'm the president of the Heartland Institute. Thank you all very much for joining us today uh, for this memorial service uh, in honor of Elizabeth Clark. Um, I'm going to tell you very briefly about the Heartland Institute and our connection with Elizabeth. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. Um, I did not know her nearly as well as some of the other people who are going to be giving remarks today. So I'm going to keep my remarks very brief and let them tell you the full story about a really remarkable person. Um, the Heartland Institute, excuse me, Heartland Institute just moved into this building about a year ago. Uh, so we're fresh to the suburbs. Uh, we love this building. I've given a couple of tours, so you all know just how proud I am of it. Um, uh, my wife and I, Diane, have lived out here in the northwest suburbs uh, for 25 years. Uh, so it's home for us. It's really nice being 10 minutes away now from the office of the Heartland Institute. Uh, for 31 years, the Heartland Institute was located in downtown Chicago. And the rent finally got to be too high. And the lack of friends and allies in downtown Chicago finally got to be too depressing. <laughs> so we decided to move out here to the northwest suburbs where there's a few more Republicans and people who still remember what freedom is all about. The Heartland Institute is a free market think tank, uh, a coalition of conservatives and libertarians coming together to try to restore freedom and protect freedom in America. Uh, more freedom, less government is our slogan. We do a lot of publishing, a lot of research. We hold events. Uh, we do podcasts. I hope you'll take a look at heartland.org, our website, uh, newly relaunched, beautiful and easy to navigate. So I think you'll find it uh, a great place to find research and commentary on all of the issues of the day. So Elizabeth Clark passed away just recently. Um, she was a remarkable woman, as you're going to discover. I first met her probably in 1984, the year the Heartland Institute was started, maybe 1985. She was one of the very first people to attend our events. She signed up as a Heartland member, and she was a donor. Uh, she and Ed would attend all of our events. She was a regular. Uh, she welcomed us into the conservative movement. She served as a mentor for an entire generation of conservative and libertarian activists here in Illinois. Uh, just a, a wonderful person. She would take our literature and share it with other organizations, take the literature of other organizations like Eagle Forum and share it with members of the Heartland Institute at our events. Um, so, uh, as I say, other people knew her better, so I'm going to let them uh, give you more detail. But I'll make just three observations on kind of the significance of Elizabeth Clark. Elizabeth and Ed, in the 1960s and 1970s, were part of a very brave group of conservatives who were calling out the left on what they were doing. So they were talking about how left-wing academics were taking over universities how they were changing the curriculum in schools, how they were kind of operating under a false flag, um, that they were claiming to be independent and honest referees, when in fact they were biased advocates for socialism and communism. Um, that was not a popular message in the 60s and the 70s. It's not a popular message today. Uh, so it took courage and creativity to be able to make that argument. Um, Elizabeth and Ed were real heroes and very brave people to be doing that in the 60s and the 70s. My second observation is from the 60s and 70s to today, people like Ed and Elizabeth formed uh, the function of a bridge. They took that experience of being activists during the, the Cold War, during a, a time before Ronald Reagan when being conservative wasn't cool, and they took that experience and handed it off to the next generation. And it was absolutely essential. Uh, Ronald Reagan used to say freedom is only one generation thick. We're only one generation away from losing it all. Every generation needs to fight for freedom uh, in its own time. And people like Ed and Elizabeth made that possible. They were that essential bridge from one generation to the next. And my third observation is looking forward. Um, I think Ed and Elizabeth were role models for all of us, and especially for the younger people in this room. 
uh, they really prove that you can change the world if you put your mind to it. Um, it's an idea that's ridiculed, especially by people on the left. They don't believe individuals can run their own lives, much less change the world. Uh, but if you're a libertarian or a conservative who appreciates the value of ideas and understands human history, you can literally change the world uh, by becoming an activist, by educating the people around you, your neighbors, your friends, and your family members. So I think Elizabeth and Ed are role models for all of us to continue to do these things. Um, I would ask you to think about how you want to be remembered. Um, it's, I don't think, a morbid thought to imagine over the course of the next hour, hour and a half, um, is an event like this going to be held for me when I pass away? Okay, what do you want to, how do you want to be remembered and what do you have to do to be remembered that way? Um, all of us want to be remembered as good spouses and good brothers and sisters and good parents. Um, some of us want to be remembered as advocates for the freedom of others. I think it's the highest calling. And Elizabeth and, and Ed accomplished that. And as a result, we have an event like this uh, being recorded and going to be broadcast on the Internet uh, for everybody to watch. Uh, we can do the same thing in our lives. And when we pass away, let's hope that people remember us as having been advocates and heroes for freedom in our time. So without further ado, let me introduce Nancy Thorner. Nancy, where is Nancy? There she is. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, we've got a couple of people joining us just now. Um, but I won't be interrupted. Uh, Nancy is a native of Reading, Pennsylvania. Reading, Reading Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania, obviously. Uh, she has a BS and master's degrees in music. She taught music for many years. She still plays the cello in the North Suburban Symphony in Lake Forest. Yep. Uh, she works for Illinois Review or writes for Illinois Review. She's extraordinarily prolific, a beautiful writer, very talented person. She attends all of Heartland's events and uh, reports them to everyone. We are deeply grateful to her. She was a very close personal friend of Elizabeth. Please welcome Nancy Thorner. Thank you, Joe. Uh, do you want me to talk? Uh, just, I'll speak with Phil Slappy later on, I guess. What she had. When do you want me to do Phil Slappy? Or what she wrote, Phil Slappy? Uh, feel free to read that. Oh, whatever. That. Okay, I'll do it afterwards, after oh, remarks. No, okay. It's so nice to be here today. Uh, Elizabeth was very, very special to me. We knew each other for quite a number of years, uh, but I really got to know Elizabeth the six weeks after she had suffered her stroke and then before she died, and we shared so much at that time. We discovered we had so much in common. We were both political junkies. We both liked to watch the same news programs, and we both enjoyed talking to each other about what was happening because we felt that we understood each other and our thoughts, and we weren't afraid to talk about anything with each other. Uh, and we were all concerned, or both of us were concerned, about the young people and how the young people didn't seem to be involved as far as even wanting to write anymore or being involved in the political situation. And we thought that, well, we both felt or experienced that we, not that we felt uncomfortable with them, but that it was difficult to understand young people and their actions and how they felt. Because certainly when we were growing up, our schools taught us patriotism. It was unbelievable because even as she was in her bed for the last six weeks of her life, her mind was just acute. It was unbelievable. Her memory, she would apologize to me once in a while when she told me to look for something in a file or a book that she knew she had upstairs in a cabinet or something of that sort. She would say, Nancy, it's there, and I would come down from upstairs and say, well, I couldn't find it. But most of the time, it was right there where she said it was. And then she would say, Nancy, I'm so sorry. My memory isn't very, very good. 
And, and I said, Elizabeth, your memory is better than mine. Sometimes I can't even remember what I did yesterday. And she would get a big chuckle out of that. But she loved to tell stories. And she also loved to tell me things that she thought I should be writing about and that I should be getting out to people. And uh, I'm still trying to do that with all the information that she gave me and that I found in her files, which I duplicated lots of it for my own use. One of the stories that was very dear to her heart was called, at least she called it, The Bread Machine. The real title was The Magnificent Bread Machine. And after I told Joe Mars about it and, and, and Bob Russell, they both remembered the story of the poem and it was also made into a movie. Well, the crux of the movie, or the whole idea of the bread machine, was to teach children, young children especially, about the enterprise system, the free market system. She delighted in telling the story over and over. She said, Nancy, the person came to take my blood, blood today. Nancy, the person came to take x-rays today. And I told them this story. Well, first of all, let me tell you the story, and then you'll understand how it blended in to the people who were visiting her and why she told the story to them. First of all, she told the story of how there was a king, and this king was going to offer free bread to everybody in his kingdom. When the farmer heard about this, he said, the farmer said, why grow wheat if I'm not going to get any money for it? The miller said, why mill the grain if I'm not going to get any money for it? The cart driver who would take the bread to the marketplace said, I'm not going to lug the bread if I'm not going to get paid for it. The same way with the person who owned the market. He said, why should I even sell the bread even if it did come into my store because I'm not going to get paid for it. So when the people came into his store or into his shop to buy bread, the market persons just said, there is no free bread, which is so true. If you don't pay anybody for anything, is anybody going to produce? And this is the same thing that Elizabeth asked the bread person who came in, who asked the person who took x-rays, anybody who came to her house. She said, would you come to my house and do this for me if you weren't getting paid by me? And they all had to admit no. So free enterprise, getting paid for what you do is so important, and Elizabeth believed in this. Now, she also had a very interesting story to tell about Richard Nixon. Elizabeth went to Duke University in North Carolina. She graduated in 1939. During that time, Richard Nixon came to Duke University because he wanted to get his master's degree, or just his law degree. And, but he was so very poor. He was born a Quaker, as we all know. Uh, what he did, the story is told differently. Some people say he got cardboard. Elizabeth told me that she, he gathered up planks and built a hut in back of the woman's dormitory in the trees. Because at that time, there was a woman's dormitory and a man's dorm, a woman's school and a man's school. Now, Richard Nixon was so poor, he couldn't afford to live in the dormitory. This is what he, why he had to do that. He couldn't afford to get a haircut, and his hair, Elizabeth told me, was like an Afro-American. It was all over the place. Also, he couldn't afford to ride the bus between the dormitories or between the schools, so he had to walk. He also had to study in the library. And the girls made fun of him. Elizabeth didn't make fun of him, I'm sure, but she pitied him because this is what he had to do. But lo and behold, where everybody was saying nobody good would ever graduate from Duke, they're one of the poorest people who ever came or ever went to Duke University. He is the one that became president. So uh, that just shows. Another thing that maybe uh, Joe Mars, who's going to speak next, will remember is that Elizabeth loved history. She loved doting on history and things that happened. And one day she asked me, Nancy, do you know what one of the first patent laws was that was passed by George Washington? And I said, no. She said, well, it was the patent law. She said, because after all, with the new patent law, 
the country could explode with innovation because after all, if you have a right to benefit and to keep the product of your own thought, that is when you are more likely to do things then and achieve what you want to achieve because the government does not have control of what you do. Now, another funny thing that happened and which Peggy's, uh, which Elizabeth's one daughter shared with me, Peggy, uh, Peggy um, um, oh, I know the last name so well, uh, Peggy Warden, who is here today, uh, was the story about receiving the memorial plaque. Elizabeth was very connected with many, many organizations, but she worked with the DRA, uh, I think it was for 65 years, and they wanted to come to her house and hold a service and give her a plaque. Well, Elizabeth told me the day before they called, when they called her up and wanted to come, she said, Nancy, don't they know that I'm in bed? Don't they know what shape I'm in and yet they want to come and give me a plaque? Well, the next day, she told me that they had come, they had had a special service for her, and they gave her the plaque, and the plaque, not the plaque, but the paper that they received is down there on the first table. And uh, she was really delighted that she could have this plaque. And during the course of my time, uh, Elizabeth gave me a little dolly, an Indian doll, that she got at Fort Sill. It was so cute. I loved it. And right away, I, I held it to my breast. And I said, oh, I love this, Elizabeth. I'll cherish it forever. And, she, and I said to Elizabeth, I'm going to call this doll Elizabeth. And Elizabeth with a sparkle in her eye and with a twinkle in her eye, too, and, and with a voice that spoke with very much satisfaction, said, but that's no name for an Indian doll. <laughs> anyway, I still call it Elizabeth. She got it at Fort Sill in 1940. Also, on my birthday in May, a couple weeks before she had her accident and stroke, why, um, she had brought to my house, and what was always strange, I never knew if Elizabeth would be driving herself or her caretaker would be driving. And her caretaker would be sitting in the seat to run things up to my house, like a book or whatever it was. But anyway, I was away that day, and Elizabeth called me on the phone and said, Nancy, did you check your front door? There's something hanging on your front door. And I said, oh, not yet, Elizabeth. So I checked the front door, and there on the front door was a pen. She said, I use these pens, too. It had a light on the end. And she said, now, when you go and take notes, you have to use this pen. And so I call it my Elizabeth pen, and now I take notes with it all the time. <laughs> and the last thing, she was very concerned about me when I drove to places in the nighttime. She knew I was going to Heartland a lot, almost every Wednesday, to hear their book reviews and things of that sort. So she said, I gave my family one of these, too. And it's that yellow device that's on the table, and it's so I could hit the window and break the window. I could cut my seatbelt if I were stuck, and I could put the beam on my car so if I knew I was having trouble, somebody would stop and help me. And she said, Nancy, Nancy, carry this in your car all the time because if anything happens to you, I don't want anything to happen to you. You will have this all the time. And, uh, and I do keep it with me all the time. And what I would like to say in closing, I do have something to read from Phyllis Schlafly because Phyllis Schlafly and Elizabeth were heart friends because they felt each other in the heart. They were such loyal friends for such a long time. But Elizabeth told me, mm -hmm. and this is very touching, she told me that she'd always be sitting on my shoulder, looking over me all the time, and I do feel that she is here with me today and with all of you and enjoying the great fuss being made of her, although she would probably say, why make such a big fuss over me because she was so modest. But anyway, she would be pleased. And Elizabeth was pleased, very loving, and very caring. And I'm so fortunate to have a friend, and she was also my mentor. Now I would like to read to you something that Phyllis Schlafly sent to me this week. And she wrote it on August the 17th. Now, one must remember 
that Phyllis just celebrated her 92nd birthday this past Monday. So she's getting up in age two. This is from Elizabeth Clark, I, rather for Elizabeth Clark from Phyllis Lafley. Whenever anyone asks me about Elizabeth Clark, I tell them about my oldest and dearest friend. We were both from Illinois, and together we had a passion for politics and grassroots activism and loved our country so much that we wanted to serve it through those means. We worked together on so many important issues. We were determined to win. I don't really remember a time in my political life without Elizabeth being a part of it. We both were active in securing great audio tapes of lectures and interviews and passing them out to eagles for coffee discussion groups. This was the old way, social media. From the start, she was all about education. Our relationship really took off as we battled the ERA in Illinois, and that was a battle. Elizabeth was a key organizer, putting together an in-depth analysis of all the legislators' views and upgrading the list every year to the 10-year fight. Numerous times when I had an event in Chicago or a layover there after an event out east, Elizabeth and Ted, which she called her husband, she didn't call her husband for some reason. Uh, uh, well, she just preferred to call him Ted uh, instead of Edwin let me stay at their place for a home away from home. One November, Elizabeth and I drove up to Ripon, Wisconsin, where I debated Karen DeCrow on the ERA. The trip home was one we didn't forget soon through a blinding blizzard. When we were unsure about holding a party for the end of ERA after seven years, then Congress voted for an illegal three-year extension to that amendment. We still felt we needed added wisdom. So on a trip to Chicago, we called a meeting of our Chicago Stop ERA, the Husband's Auxiliary, which, which was made up of John Trowbridge, Jerry Sullivan, Ted Clark, and Fred Slafley. The men advised that if we must have the celebration, we should at least make it small. We appreciated their sage advice and then took our own advice and had a very a successful and large gala event. <laughs> Elizabeth was influential in the success of Stop ERA and then Eagle Form in those early years, developing regional meetings throughout Illinois to, to defeat ERA in that very tough battleground. She helped determine the direction of Eagle Farm and with her great passion for education and national defense. Elizabeth was born into a military family and knew and cared a great deal about our nation's defense. Her knowledge and interest in the military, national defense, and the strategic defense initiative, which was proposed by President Reagan, was invaluable to building up the strength of our military and defense during the Reagan administration. It was a treat to have a friend who could speak so knowingly about defense issues. She was a great promoter of local activities and activism to improve public schools. Elizabeth personally studied and monitored the curricula and policies of school districts in Illinois and many other states to help grassroots conservatives make positive changes in their schools. She taught conservatives how to elect good candidates to their local school boards. As she helped steer the Eagle Forum toward educational issues, she became a founding board member of our new Eagle Forum Education and Legal Defense Fund, not only an influential member, but the secretary for nearly 20 years. As the time went by and technology changed, Elizabeth surprised me and the young people in my office when her email started noting, sent for my iPad. I was impressed, but not totally surprised that Elizabeth was again using the latest technology in her consulting work and continuing work as an activist. Illinois and the United States were better, more moral, 
and stronger because of Elizabeth's selfless labors, and I cherish her loving friendship. Thank you very much for your attention and for listening to what I had to say and her heart friend, Phil Slafly, in St. Louis, Missouri, where she now lives and still with Eagle Farm at 92. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That was fantastic. I failed to mention that Nancy brought a lot of letters and memorabilia from Elizabeth. Um, it's on three tables in this room. Uh, she put a lot of time and effort into accumulating this stuff, and it's fascinating. So I hope you have a chance to take a look at it. I'm sorry? There's extra copies as well on this table here, so feel free to take stuff home with you. Um, Heartland is also the home of the Elizabeth Ar uh, Clark archives, or at least part of the archives. So we've got maybe four now file cabinets worth of material that she had accumulated over the years. Over time, we're going to go through and, and try to sort uh, some of this material, find highlights from it, and occasionally put it on exhibit. So it's a fascinating look at the conservative movement uh, over the last 50 years. The next speaker is Joe Morris. He hails from Gary, Indiana. Back in the day, he's a graduate of the University of Chicago College and the law school. He's a former assistant attorney general of the United States and held other positions in the Reagan administration. He's the president and general counsel of the Lincoln Legal Foundation, and he belongs to Kathy Morris. Please welcome Joe Morris. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see a whole bunch of new friends, old friends, but as well new friends today, brought together by the memory of Elizabeth Clark. Um, I want to thank, on behalf of all of us, uh, Joe Bast and, and the team at the Heartland Institute and Nancy Thorner uh, for really being the spurs to make this event possible. Uh, many of us are so fond of Elizabeth. She meant so much to us in our lives. Uh, she was such a great friend and a great teacher. It's wonderful to be able to come together to meet her children and family, uh, to celebrate her life with them and, and with each other, uh, and, and have an occasion to remember her. The deeper commitment that Heartland has made to her memory and that Nancy made in, in doing the work of sifting through her papers and effects in creating that archive is really phenomenal. Uh, this is a life worth remembering. It will be re worth remembering a long time from now. The papers, when you read them, uh, will, will, be, will be stimulating, and I suspect they'll still be stimulating and interesting to people, not just for PhD theses, not just for retrospectives in, uh, in a couple of decades. They'll still have messages to send. At the conclusion of my remarks, I'm going to introduce a couple of clips uh, from Elizabeth herself, from an interview that I conducted with Elizabeth uh, four years ago when she was 94, maybe it was two years ago when she was 96, two years ago when she was 96, in Heartland's old offices downtown. I conducted an interview with Elizabeth, memories of her early years and middle years, her political activism and, and so forth, which uh, is uh, archived uh, in Heartland's online library of podcasts. And you can find the entire thing there, uh, and, and it's it, it, absolutely fascinating. Um, when I woke up at an early hour this morning, I brought in the morning newspapers. And as I laid them out before me on the breakfast table, in my head, the telephone rang. Elizabeth sits on Nancy Thorner's shoulder, but sh she's on the other end of a telephone in my head, in my head. The, the telephone rang this morning, and I Elizabeth's voice was on the other end of the telephone. And Elizabeth said to me, yesterday, the Department of State effectively admitted that President Obama lied when he said that the shipment of all that money to the Iranians was not a ransom. It wasn't a bribe paid for the freedom of American hostages. And yesterday, a federal judge in Washington, D.C., ordered Hillary Clinton to answer in writing under oath the questions being posed to her by, the, uh, by Judicial Watch uh, regarding that server in her basement. She said, that news happened yesterday, but this morning, Joe, the Chicago Sun-Times wants you to think that the biggest story on earth yesterday was that some stupid swimmer in Rio de Janeiro got into trouble at a holdup at a 7-Eleven at a equivalent. She said, bear that in mind as you're reading this morning's newspapers. 
that was uh, an authentic Elizabeth Clark message. It came, the phone was in my head, but it was the kind of thing that Elizabeth would, in fact, pick up the phone to say, or she would uh, send a message by email. I saw a lot of Elizabeth Clark as long as her father, as her husband, your dad, Ed, was still alive. When Ed, the late Ed, who was a great man in his own right, uh, was still living, uh, the Clarks were fixtures in the, in, the, in the public policy scene in the Chicago area. There was not a meeting of the Heartland Institute, the United Republican Fund, Americans United for Life, the Legal Lincoln Foundation. You name a group of friends of freedom, and Elizabeth and Ed Clark were there. They were often the oldest people in the room, but they were often the heartiest uh, people in the room. I first laid eyes on them in 1976. I was telling Elizabeth's children a little earlier this afternoon about how in 1976, Republicans in Illinois were divided in support between President Ford, who was running for election, and Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, the who, former governor at that point, who was challenging him for the Republican nomination for president. And the divide pretty much, pretty much came along age lines. The senior party was supporting President Ford. The young Republicans and the college Republicans were supporting Governor Reagan. I recall being at a meeting of young Republicans and college Republicans. Uh, I was in my early or mid-20s. At, uh, at that point, uh, I had dark hair. Bob Gordon, who was sitting over here in the corner, was, was at that meeting. There was a 20 or 21-year-old woman who was the head of the chapter of Young Americans for Freedom at the University of Illinois, Chicago Circle Campus. Uh, Fran Griffin, may, many, many of you may know Fran Griffin, who was from uh, the Beverly neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, uh, was there uh, at, at, that, at that meeting. There were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 other people all in their 20s who were attending this meeting. And then there were Ed and Elizabeth Clark, who at that point uh, were well into their 50s um, uh, at this meeting of sort of young pro-Reagan Republicans. And that was, that was when I first met uh, Ed and Elizabeth Clark. Uh, as I said, there was hardly a party, a rally, a conference, a, a meeting, a colloquium, a seminar on some issue that was important to the survival of human liberty that was held in the Chicago area that, that they did not attend, that they did not support in some way or another. In fact, the support that they would offer uh, was often uh, extraordinary. I, I once was organizing one of the early Chicago conservative conferences that Heartland, Lincoln Legal, and several other organizations cooperated in uh, uh, holding. And I, I received a telephone call at my office one day from a, an Illinois state senator. I had not met him, but a fairly important, well-known conservative, and said, Mr. Morris, this is Senator so-and-so. Elizabeth Clark told me to call you. Yes, he said, uh, she, she, she said you're having a conference this weekend down at the Palmer House, and she said, I should be there. I said, is there room for me? I said, Senator, if Elizabeth Clark said you should be there, you should be there, there is room for you. And I, I said, as a matter of fact, Senator, on, we're, we're, we're starting with dinner on Friday night. We'll go run through all, all through the day on Saturday. Uh, there'll be a panel, a conversation with something like this, there'll be a panel on Saturday afternoon. Joe Bast of the Heartland Institute will be moderating the panel. I men mentioned a couple other people beyond the panel. You ought to be on that panel, Senator, because the topic is something I understand you're interested in. And he said, would Elizabeth Clark want me to be on that panel? I said, yes, sir, she would want you to be on that panel. He said, all right, I'll do the panel. I called Elizabeth to thank her, and I said, how did you get in to see Senator and so-and-so? She said, I took a plate of cookies. I took a plate of cookies, and the senator saw me. We sat there, he sat there eating my cookies, and I told him he, the, there were three or four things he needed to do, and one of them was he needed to be at your conference. That, that, that's, that's how Elizabeth would get in the door, and then, and then, and then, and then she would proceed to, to make the necessary points. Uh, there came a time, of course, when Ed passed away, and the occasions then when I would see Elizabeth face-to-face -face diminished. She didn't, she didn't make the rounds. Uh, as often, as frequently uh, as she did when, when Ed was still alive. But you know how it is when you're at a party or at a conference or at a gathering such as this. You may have the privilege of sitting next to somebody over lunch or dinner or something, and then you get to have the chance to have a, a, a much of a conversation, but, but otherwise you, you, get to, you get to chat for a minute or two uh, before, the, before the gathering uh, breaks up. And it, it's, it's worth doing, but it's not an in-depth conversation. So I, 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 although I saw a lot of Elizabeth Clark and had a lot of two-minute conversations, 
with Elizabeth Clark and the occasional by chance being able to sit next to her at a breakfast or something and, and talk for 20 solid minutes, uh, very, 20 very valuable solid minutes about something. The real conversations with Elizabeth came later when she was pretty much homebound and she was the mistress of technology. Nancy has adverted to the fact that she was uh, uh, schooled in the use of email and electronic communications, that she graduated to, to an iPad so that she could lie in bed even when she was ill. She could lie in bed and communicate with the world from her iPad. But <clears throat> I'm not sure that Nancy has conveyed to you a sense of the volume and the depth of these communications because I didn't hear from Elizabeth once a month by email. I didn't hear from Elizabeth once a week by email. I didn't hear from Elizabeth once a day by, e by email. I would hear from Elizabeth two, three, four times a day, and if there's something really hot going on, maybe five, six, seven, eight times a day. She would get up at a very early hour in the morning, and she would begin electronically surveying the world for news. My sense, based on the timing of her traffic, was she began the day by reading the online edition of the South China Morning Post. She had a history in China. You're going to hear about that in, in, in a minute or two. She, she had a history in China in the early part of the 20th century and, and maintained a lifelong interest in the civilization, that, that civilization. But she was interested in the civilizations of the world. Elizabeth, like Ed, was a pretty sophisticated person. She was passionate, an unbounded passion f in her love of the United States of America. She saw this in the words of others, is the, the world's last best hope for preserving individual freedom and for preserving the kind of civilization, the kind of Judeo-Christian based civilization that makes the preservation of freedom possible. And if you get those ideas, if you get the connection between liberty and civilization, the, 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 the connection between freedom and a society that is peopled by people, by persons who, edu who are educated by their families and their traditions to, to self-discipline and civic virtue that makes a freedom-based society possible, then you get the political theory of George Washington, you get the political theory of Elizabeth Clark. I mean, that's where she stood. But she understood that America was a civilization in a, in a world, and there was a lot to learn from and about this entire world, that there were intersections in history and there are intersections today and solid citizenship meant one had to know that history, one had to know the intersections of these civilizations and study them respectfully and intelligently, and that's what she did. And this stream of emails that she sent to me, sometimes it would be her own commentary, sometimes it would be links to articles that she thought I should know. They were all over the map. They had to do with foreign policy, national defense, uh, cultural questions, uh, moral questions, economics, um, of, of free market matters, excellent disquisitions on by learned people on all of these topics, and she thought I should know them. I suspect that she was also sending them to Joe Bast and Nancy Thorner and, and many other people in the room. She would be selective. I'm, well, I know uh, that um, uh, Fran Eaton is going to be interested in these three things, but only one of them is interested to Joe Morris, so I'll send three to Fran and I'll send one to Joe, or vice versa, or something like that. So some of the, some of the stuff we would be seeing together. But, but she, was, she was in her own way building and feeding, nurturing, this community of, of her friends and fellows, her neighbors, her colleagues, her, her allies, who cared deeply about the same things that she cared about and for the same reason. She, she, was, she and Ed were long uh, active in the National Federation of Independent Business. That was one of the organizations that they supported and on whose behalf sometimes they would, they would speak. So she often spoke about monopoly. Um, Joe Bast, most conservatives, most free, free market people don't care for monopolies because for the most part monopolies are not natural organic creations of the free market. It almost always requires the imposition of government power, government force to create a monopoly. And free market will destroy a monopoly, which is why Joe, Joe Bast never played the game Monopoly, which is why he didn't know about the Reading Railroad, which is why he didn't know how to pronounce Nancy Thorner's uh, hometown's name. Because if, if you play Monopoly, you know about the Reading Railroad. But, but uh, to, to come back to a point that Nancy, Nancy Thorner made, for example, Elizabeth truly thought, and she was not alone among great Americans in thinking this, she, she, shared, she shared the thought that the, the idea of a patent or a copyright is really important. It's important for freedom and it's important for making America great. A thought she shared with 
no lesser figures than George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the only American president actually ever to hold a patent. Because patents actually did two things. I'm going to add something to, add an Elizabethan Clark, Clarkian point to Nancy Thorner's point. Yes, the patent preserves by a monopoly for a limited amount of time um, a, 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 the, the exclusive right to the creator of something to use it and to profit from it. And what does that accomplish? What does that limited monopoly accomplish? It, it provides an incentive for someone to create, to spend the time, the 10% uh, inspiration, 90% perspiration, as Thomas Edison said, is behind all successful invention, to put in the inspiration and the perspiration to create new things and make them work. But there is a trade-off, and the trade-off is also very important to understanding how a free people works. Because to get the patent, what you have to do is you have to make your discovery public, right? You take your discovery and you take it to the patent office. You take your drawings and your description of your invention to the patent office. And you lay it out in public in the patent office. And in exchange for doing that, you get the protection you get for, for whatever the period of your patent is, 14 years or whatever the time period that the law provides is, you get the exclusive right of the benefit of that discovery. But you, by making the discovery public, what you have done is you have shared information transparently with everybody else in America. So that other bright people can look at what you've done and they can say that can be an inspiration to them to build on, to improve your technology, to find some concept that maybe they can apply in some other realm in some other way. Maybe even during the life of your patent, just being, being inspired as well, I can think of something else that this, this reminds me of and come up with something completely different but inspired by that or after the patent expires to make improvements on it further and further because knowledge turns out to be an important piece of property. And knowledge, the diffusion of this property, the, the diffusion of knowledge, of information, is also something that will make a society great. So if you, can, if, if you both can inspire people to monetize, that is, earn money, earn value for thinking, for creating, for inventing, and you can, you can disseminate the information of, of their discoveries to ever wider circles of people, you build a society that is not only freer, but also richer. And, that, and freedom and, and information, the free sharing of information, information as private property where somebody has an interest in protecting it and, 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 and getting value from it, will make the society ever and ever more richer for everybody in it. So that the genius of the patent system was both respecting thinking as protectable property from which somebody could make money or other value and encouraging people to share their thinking, which is why, which is why the great, one of the great virtues of American society in, in contradistinction to tyrannical totalitarian societies is its openness. This is why we speak of open societies versus closed societies, something that Elizabeth was happy to teach about too. She had spent much time in closed societies, and she thought there was a lot to learn about closed societies. Th there are always temptations to take an open society and close it. She wanted us to fight that. Closed societies end up um, uh, doing a lot of damage, uh, not just to individual freedom, but also to the fabric of civilization. Civilization progresses, moral life, healthy, productive, elevating, cultural life will proceed better in a society that is free and open, an argument that Elizabeth would make over and over again. These arguments, as you heard from Nancy, of course, are arguments that, that Elizabeth was making right till the very end of her life. Uh, I had a number of telephone conversations with her in the last several weeks of her life. The, the telephone conversations began dramatically uh, in, that, in that period with Elizabeth telling me that she was dying. She began a conversation one day. She called me up on the phone and said, I am dying, she said. And my doctors tell me there's no hope. And uh, oh, they tell me that there are all kinds of things they could do, but they don't think there's going to be much success to them. They'd be very painful and very troubling and probably won't extend my life, and I'm not going to let them do it. She said, if, if God is telling me that it's my time, 
well, it'll be my time, uh, but I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to have my life diminished uh, by things that are not going to preserve my life. And this vexed Nancy and others of her friends very much that she was, Nancy was concerned, in, Nancy in particular was concerned, is she being abandoned? Are the doctors mistreating her? Are the doctors look, looking the other way? And we studied the situation carefully. She visited. We spoke with Elizabeth several times. And we came to the conclusion, no, the doctors were very worried about Elizabeth. Yes, Elizabeth's family is very worried about Elizabeth. But Elizabeth is the boss. <laughs> to, to the end of her life, Elizabeth was in charge. She was in charge of every aspect of her life, as a free woman ought to be. Uh, she, was not, she, was, she, was, she, was, she never lost control of her mind, and her mind never lost control of her will. Um, so. Uh, there were these remarkable vignettes, uh, as Nancy has adverted, where people would be coming to the house even in the last weeks of her life. Stunning incident was one time I phoned her and she uh, had to beg off. Uh, she, was ha she, she said, bear with me, Joe, for just a moment. And I heard her say to her caregiver, listen, I will continue this conversation with you in just a moment. I need to speak to my friend if you don't mind. And, and I heard the caregiver, oh, that's, that's okay. And Elizabeth came back on the phone. She said, I was just telling my caregiver who's worried about the quality of the education that her daughter is getting. I, I, was just, I was just explaining to her how charter schools and school choice works. And if she ever gets the opportunity to send her daughter to a charter school or get a school voucher, she should do so. She said, because there's no reason why anybody should never have a choice. She said, what I, if, what, what I accepted if the government said to me, you can only have one doctor. That's your doctor and at the end, your choices end right. I would never accept that. Why should anybody accept it when the government says, you've got to go to one school. It's the only school for you. No, you, anybody should have a choice of, of going to schools. And I was explaining to my caregiver why she should, she look, should look for choices for her doctors. One day, she called me, very proud to tell me, she knew I was concerned about her condition, very proud to tell me that a, a hospital bed had just been delivered to her, her house. Where she was having difficulty getting up to the upstairs. And the hospital bed was set up in the den on the first floor of her home. And, 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 and she, she wanted to tell me that the, the hospital bed had been delivered. And then she proceeded to tell me about the lecture that she gave to the delivery men who brought in and set up the hospital bed. And the lecture was along the lines of the lecture that you heard from, from Nancy. I'm not sure that it was the bread machine lecture, which was one of her favorites, but it was some other lecture about the morality and the nobility of private enterprise and free labor. And imagine that here is a woman who, who is welcoming in the men who were delivering into her house the bed in which she plans to die of natural causes in due course. But that's not what's on her mind. What's on her mind is making sure that these people know about freedom and that she sends them forth with assignments to read newspapers, write their congressmen, write letters to the editor, call the talk shows, and be voices for freedom. And here's why you should do it, you in your line of work. That, that, and she wanted, me to, she wanted me to hear the lecture that she had given to, uh, to these, these delivery men. That was Elizabeth Clark. Uh, Elizabeth Clark was a, a model of someone who took responsibility for herself, her life, her choices. Uh, she showed how freedom and responsibility really are opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, there's nothing irresponsible about wanting to be as free as possible. If you accept freedom, you accept with it the responsibilities for the decisions that you make. And she was, she was proud of that. She saw the connections between the morality of freedom and the morality of, of a Judeo-Christian life. Um, she wore her, her faith, her religion, lightly, I'm, I must say. I mean, she, she made truck with Jews, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, people of all walks of life, including people of no religious faith at all. I remember at one time at a meeting of the Fort Dearborn group, uh, the late Joseph Cardinal Bernardin, the, the Archbishop of Chicago, was still alive, and he had said something that uh, shall I say, vexed us uh, respecting national security policy decisions of the United States. Uh, he wasn't quite as friendly to the American military, say, as Elizabeth and I might have been. And I made some reference to Cardinal Bernardin, and Elizabeth snorted. Now, it, it was a very delicate, very feminine and, and elegant snort, but if you knew Elizabeth, you know that snort. You know, it was a very, very delicate, um, genteel snort. <laughs> cardinal Bernard, and she said, he's, he's no cardinal. And she said, Minzenti, now there's my kind of cardinal. <laughs> cardinal Minzenti, of course, was the, uh, the uh, 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 
Roman Catholic Archbishop of Budapest, uh, who a st stout resistor of Soviet totalitarianism uh, was put on a murder list, a hit list of the KGB, got wind of it and sought refuge in the American embassy in Budapest and lived the rest of his life in the United States Embassy in Budapest was given given asylum by the United States right there, but there's no way to get him out of the country. He was, you know, except to, I suppose, pack him into a diplomatic pouch and send him out, which is no way for a cardinal to travel, no way for any human to travel. So he lived in exile within Hungary in, in the United States Embassy in, in Budapest uh, for much the rest of his life. Uh, uh, Pope, I think it was John the Twenty Third, if I'm not mistaken, made him a cardinal in pectorum, uh, that is, it was secretly, uh, and eventually disclosed, of course. Um, but he, he led the church from within the embassy of the United States and was fearless. I mean, realizing that six inches away was sure, certain death, uh, getting too close to the window might be certain death. Uh, fearlessly, there was the steady stream of commentary from Cardinal Menzenti about the immorality of totalitarian leftist systems. Uh, it is shocking uh, that today, 20 years after the fall of communism, that these lessons are still not learned by many people in the West, uh, including in the faculty lounges and faculty studies uh, of the West. It shocks the, the conscience that that is true. Elizabeth was not at all afraid of foreign cultures and civilizations. As a young woman, uh, she traveled with her mother by sea to China. Um, she had some remarkable, spent a fair amount of time actually in China, had some remarkable experiences in China. She got off the leash of her mother and spent time with other young people in Shanghai and elsewhere in China and observed some of the uh, death customs. She never had a fear of death. Um, uh, she observed funerary customs in China. She also observed sexual customs in China. She encountered a family uh, in, in, in which a wife and a concubine lived side by side. And uh, encountering this, at a, I think still in her teens, she calmly assimilated this information and realized that the world is made up of strikingly different kinds of people. She encountered a village in China which was peopled by tall Chinese folks with blue eyes. Wh where did this come from? Well, you'll hear the story. It came from an American flyer who was held prisoner and went to stud, was forced at gunpoint to go to stud, in, in stud service in this, in this village. That opened her eyes to the fact that, that there are people in the world who don't quite share the same cultural norms of, of Elizabeth and, and, and the very tolerant, uh, but very uh, sophisticated world f in, in that she inhabited and she helped make. But she realized that there were some, some very different norms out there. She wasn't about to embrace them or uh, adop adopt them or endorse them, but she certainly thought that we ought to be aware of them so that when Americans, as we must, rub elbows, do business in this great wide world, wide world with people who are very different from us, we don't make the mistake of assuming that their values, their cultural aspirations are always identical to ours. Sometimes they are very, very different from ours. And what that means is we should not assume blithely, as sh she would argue, that merely coming in, into uh, 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 contact with, it, merely encountering the wonderful consumer advantages of life in the West or the fabulous entertainment products of Hollywood and other other Western sources mean that people all over the world are automatically adopting our cultural values and seeing the world through the lenses through which we see them. She wanted us to believe, as sometimes those in power in Washington do not see things, that the world remains, even after this great interconnectedness made possible by commerce and technology, the world remains a dangerous place and remains a place peopled by people, by folks, with attitudes and orientations that are different from ours they deserve to be respected not only for our protection, but, but out of respect that's owed to other surviving cultures, civilizations, and traditions as well. She absorbed this at a very young age, as you will hear in these stories that Keeley is about to launch uh, for us by sound. That what you'll be hearing is Elizabeth's own voice 
Um, it, experiences like this that she, and she had from a tender age as a military child, as a woman very strong, courageous, moving about freely in the, in the world, helped shape the way she learned and in turn the way she taught. And I close with a focus that, that she would want on the meaning of her life. It was that she lived her life in a very big world as a very proud American that she understood at the root of things the great compact that makes America different. It is the belief in the values of the Declaration of Independence and the precepts, the rules on which we agreed when we, when we adopted the Constitution of the United States. She would often make the point that what defines an American is really one thing, is are you willing to raise that hand and pledge to support the Constitution of the United States? If you do that and you mean it, you're really an American, no matter who you are and where you came from. If you get what the Constitution means, what it stands for, those principles, those precepts, those values, then you really are an American and you're welcome to the fold. Um, that's what binds us together and that's what she would want us to remember. What you're now going to hear are just a few minutes of excerpts in Elizabeth's own voice from the longer interview that I did with her two years ago, the entirety of which is on the, uh, the Heartland uh, podcast archive. Keely, can we do that, please? But speaking of the different levels, in Tencent, in Peking, we went to a funeral of a very famous businessman. And uh, when we entered the room, we were handed a coin wrapped in red paper. And we were told to put the coin in the coffin, which was open. And there were a lot of people there. And there was a big portrait on the uh, wall of the man and they, everybody was standing around and they said well when there's a white moon a uh, circle or moon on his forehead that means he's gone on to the next level well I looked at the portrait it was an oil portrait and I thought they must have doctored it some way how are they going to do that but it didn't, you couldn't see anything that had been done to it. And about half an hour, 40 minutes, there was a big white circle on his forehead and everybody was happy and they said, now he's gone on to the next level. How they did that to the portrait, I have no idea. We were in Peking because a friend of mother's college friend had married a Chinese man who promised never to take a concubine. But after 20 years, he did. And we went and visited the couple. They lived in a, what had been a temple that was surrounded by two walls. And Mother and I had one of the uh, a little cottage in the inner wall. And one of the other little cottages in the wall was a pretty little concubine. And uh, the daughter of the family who was 18 was home from Wellesley vacation and uh, she took me to visit some of her college friends who uh, talked about China and its ideas and things like that and at that time in 1935 the Japanese had taken over the northern section Manchuria they called it Manchuku and I asked these young college fellows if they weren't worried about the Japanese coming down to conquer China. And they said, oh no, we aren't worried about that. When the Mongols from Mongolia came down hundreds of years ago, why, we didn't have much military. And they came down, so we just stood there with our weapons and let them come down and set up camp, their camps. And the Mongols didn't know what to do with no resistance. But once they got settled, we sent in all our prettiest girls, three generations, all Chinese. But that's why the northern Chinese are taller than the southern Chinese. And then they said... But you, you encountered a population of blue-eyed Chinese, too, didn't you? Oh, well, that was... Let me tell you a little more about the college kids. Sure, so they, uh, they said that China is the middle kingdom and they are going to run the world at some time. 
And I said, well, how are you going to do that? Well, for the U.S., we're going to uh, send people into Canada, lots of Chinese. We're going to send them into Panama. We're going to be in the Caribbean. And uh, then we're going to send a lot of Chinese families all through the U.S. And in short time, the year surrounded, and all those families are little fishies all through the country. We raise up, and you fall like a ripe plum. And in China, they worshipped ancestors. Nobody was allowed to be better than his parents. And uh, now... That's why China stayed about the same for hundreds of years. But Mao came in and he changed that. And he also instituted more hygiene. But that's why China is so prosperous today. They got rid of the ancestor worship. Where, where did you encounter the, 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 the population of blue-eyed Chinese people? Well, a friend of mine, Colonel Bill Rooney was in charge of the uh, hump, you know, we, we brought supplies from India to China over the uh, mountains, the Himalayas, and uh, one of his pilots uh, was downed, he was, had engine trouble or something, and he was downed in the south part of China, and uh, the people in this little town had never seen a blue-eyed uh, Caucasian, never had seen a Caucasian before, and he was a tall, strapping, good-looking guy. So the mayor of the town said, well, we're not going to let you go. You're a prisoner until you impregnate every woman in the town. We want some blue-eyed, tall, strapping people here. And so the guy obliged to... He was farmed out to stud. <laughs> He did, and then they they helped him repair his plane, and he left. So the, there, and when uh, in Vietnam, the people who were up near Laos said they ran into a few blue-eyed Chinese. Of course, it's several generations later. But speaking of the different. Uh, well, thank you very much, Joe Morris, uh, for teaching us about antitrust and patent law and American history and education policy and, and everything in between. Uh, absolutely fascinating. We are honored to have some members of the family, uh, Elizabeth and Ed's family, with us. Um, Ed Clark III has agreed to come up and uh, deliver a few comments. If he leaves anything out, Margie Warden Clark is willing to cover any of his omissions. Uh, so please welcome Ed Clark III. First, I want to say thanks for coming. Uh, coming here, uh, here, here to, to uh, here to uh, uh, here to to help honor uh, to honor honor my mother Elizabeth Clark. Shortly after she passed away, uh, I felt compelled to write down some thoughts about her. And while there are many, many, many different topics I could write on, this was what came out. Duty, honor, country. Uh, many of you here will recognize that's the West Point motto. Mamum, which is what we called my mother, Mamum's dad graduated from West Point. Uh, so did her brother and, uh, and, and her nephew. Uh, her, uh, her, her son-in-law, who happens to be here today, Colonel John Warden, um, uh, uh, graduated from the Air Force Academy, which in many ways was, was a spinoff from West Point. Growing up in Mumum's household, we would watch a weekly TV show called The West Point Story. Uh, in, uh, uh, so, so, in, uh, so, so in addition to the West Point motto, we learned the story of the, of the tradition of the long gray line and, and the honor code, which is we will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor, nor tolerate those, uh, those among us who do. I think Mama would have modified the motto to be duty, honor, family, country. She did so much over the years to keep the family together. 
She sent birthday cards every year to each of her three children and to their spouses, to each of her five grandchildren and to each of her ten great-grandchildren. She was the communication link that helped to keep us, keep us, us all in touch. Mama was a truly a member of a member of the of of the greatest generation, born at the end of World War One, a college uh, a, t a teenager and college student during during the Depression. She did her part as her dad's U.S. Army uh, school to train young officers in the many arts of, of field artillery, and became a certified ambulance driver. She sent a husband off to war while raising two children. She greeted him when she came back and soon was raising a third, happens to be me. Um, by the numbers, and just to give you a sense of what our early years was like, uh, by the numbers, after she was married, she moved households 17 times, living in 10 cities over a span of 24 years before settling into Lake Forest, Illinois. During her life, she sent her brother off to war three times, her husband, son, son-in-law, granddaughter, um, uh, grandson-in-law, and grandson off to war at least once each. After her father died, she cared for her mother for eight years. Um, she and my dad enjoyed their living companionship for, for 62 years and, 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 and until he died in 2003. There are many things that, be, that can be written about the character and, and, and accomplishments of my mother, Elizabeth Allen Clark. But let me say, uh, let me end by saying I, 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 that I, excuse me, that I, I will certainly miss her very much. I will miss her four to five daily emails on, on topics of, of mutual interest. I will miss her passion and her patriotism. And I will miss her, her ever present caring for her, uh, for her extended family. Thank you much. Okay, Margie Clark is going to deliver some comments. Thank you, Margie. <laughs> well, I just want to say my husband, John, and I are so proud, humbled, honored that you would spend all this time to honor my mother and, um, and my dad. And I really can't add much to what Ed said. We all have been very proud of my mother over these years. And my job, because I lived in Montgomery, Alabama, and my sister was here, was to call her every night. And I would call about 5.30, and we discussed the events that were happening in the world. And she would encourage me to make a difference in the world and tell me again how I could change it. And, um, and then I would share with her my adventures in real estate, which that's what I do. And I, every night about 5.30 now, think, oh, I should call mom. But she's on my shoulder, as she promised she would be. And all I have to say really is, in the words of Second Timothy chapter 7, where he said, you fought the good fight, you finished the race, and you have kept the faith. And yes, I believe my mom really did. And we will miss her. And thank you, Joe, and everybody for what you've done today. It's very, very meaningful to us. Thank you, Margie. Um, would anyone else like to come up at this time? I know some of you knew Margie for, for many, many years and knew her well. Uh, we can certainly take a few more minutes if you'd like to put some comments on the record. Diane is pointing to someone behind, hiding behind a tree here. Or no one wants to say anything? Um, this is about the time that we said that we would quit. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, I think Elizabeth was a wonderful person. She would have appreciated the comments that were delivered today. I think she does have a message for all of us that you can make a difference in the world. Um, please go out and do the same thing. Thank you very much and drive home safely.